I was gone last week. You probably didn't even notice, but Pastor J.D. did a great job bringing a message from the book of John. And I'll tell you what, if anybody here did not understand who Jesus was, didn't know how to follow Christ, then they heard last week and have no question about what it is, uh, what's necessary, making peace with God. I want to pray for you real quick. And the reason is because I have a message this morning that um, is going to be hard to hear for some people. Uh, and I can tell you the reason that I know it's hard to hear is because it was really hard for me to prepare. I had to stop a couple times and just really process to pray, to confess. Um, and uh, the Holy Spirit convicted me as recently, just as last night as I was going over my notes. I'm like, man, I'm so bad at this stuff. Uh, and I'm going to bring it to you. Now, I've had a head start, so I know that I'll have a little bit more uh, time and have had a little bit more time to process. But I want to give you time to process this morning toward the end and maybe apply these things to your life in a very specific way. Now... I want to tell you that for some of you, you'll feel like this message doesn't apply to you. And it's kind of a hard thing to wrap your mind around, but if you feel like this message doesn't apply to you, it applies to you most of all. And so if you're listening to me as I go through this and we're talking and you're like, look, that, that's not me, that's not me, I, I, you know, then it's you. You've got to really pay attention. If you listen to this message and you're hearing the word and you're like, man, I've got to do better, I've got to really, you know, you know then, then that's us too. Maybe somewhere in between, I don't know. But I need to pray. And I'm not just praying for you that God will pinpoint truth in your life. I want you to pray for me that I can get this message out there because it can be life-changing for all of us. Families, friendships, churches. It can be and should be life-changing. Father, thank you so much for my friends and for the chance to be here. God, I love them. I love being with them. I love preaching the word, God. And this message is one that just speaks for itself. And so I pray that I can just get it out there. That your Holy Spirit would convict where conviction is necessary. If anyone has blind spots and calluses where they don't even see any of these things in their own life, that you, through the conviction of your Holy Spirit, would reveal those things. That we can walk away in just a few minutes profoundly different living differently, relating differently, loving much more effectively, and most of all, representing Jesus and his redemptive purpose and mission. So the rest of this time, Father, everything that's thought, said, or done, I pray it's pleasing and acceptable to you and profitable for your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Taking you back, taking you all the way back to the story that I left you with a couple weeks ago, which was the story of a dinner party thrown in Jesus' name. It was thrown in Jesus' name for a couple of reasons. One, they were celebrating the resurrection, not of Jesus. They were celebrating the resurrection of a guy named Lazarus. And so Lazarus was there. Lazarus used to be dead. They were at the home of a guy who used to have leprosy with Jesus, a person who was God, the God-man, who was going to die and rise again, defeating sin, Satan, and death once and for all. They had a party to celebrate. They had a party to unite. They had a party to worship, and this was the occasion that brought them together. Now, I can't review it, but if you did not hear the message a couple of weeks ago, it's on our podcast, on our app, on our website, on Facebook. You can go back and catch up, get some of the background and some of the history. I'm just going to read it to you very quickly, but we're going to focus on a nuance of this passage that maybe if you just read through it, you won't even notice it first, but it's been the thing as I was on vacation last week that just kept coming back in my mind that God was pinpointing pointing in my own spirit, and it's my privilege to bring it to you this morning as we study together. John chapter 12, 1 through 11. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him, and Mary took out a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, that, I hope, sounds familiar to you. Again, two, uh, two weeks ago, we had a prayer service the week before that. We covered this particular passage. We talked a lot about it, but there's a dinner party. We have one who's serving. We have one who's giving. We have one who's reclining, and then we have Jesus, who's the guest of honor. The other disciples are around, whoever else had been invited to the party, and then Judas speaks for the first time. Now, Judas is the traitor, right? The, the worst traitor of all times. I was thinking about this um, just the other day. We call people Benedict Arnold's quite a bit because because of his notorious decision to be a traitor, but very rarely do we call somebody a Judas. It's almost too personal and too nasty to say you're a Judas, um, but Judas really um, the worst villain in all of, of Scripture besides Satan himself. And Judas speaks up for the first time. 
And as he speaks up for the first time, we hear what's in his heart. He criticizes. He destroys. He diverts. And he causes disunity. We see it picked up right here with the word but. Mary gave this lavish sacrifice, this pint of perfume that would have cost about a year's wages, broke an alabaster jar, poured it on Jesus' feet, let down her hair, humbling herself, doing something that was socially really unacceptable just because she had the appropriate right phileo kind of love for Jesus Christ. Everyone else in the room worshiping, everyone focusing on Christ, everyone being moved in their spirit except one person. Now what I want you to see is that this one person handles his disagreement in the worst possible way. So the one person's disagreement becomes a number of people's disagreement, which takes the focus off Jesus, divides this little community, and Jesus has to rebuke him with the strongest language uh, that um, we see any of Jesus' rebukes in the New Testament. So the word but starts this off. It transitions the story. It goes from positive and happy. We see Judas recli- or, 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 I'm sorry, Lazarus reclining, not saying anything. We see Martha doing her thing, always serving. We see Mary giving. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was always described as the one who was later going to betray Jesus, objected. Now he objected because he saw Mary pouring perfume on Jesus' feet, very expensive perfume. He had an objection. So what? I mean, I object all the time, right? I mean, I had an objection on the way down to Arkansas when Joy and I left for our trip. My wife, I've been married almost 30 years, and I've learned that, that when she tells me she's going to do something, I say, okay, but I don't have to like it. And as we got in the car, she said, I'm drinking this trip. And I was like, what? And I'm thinking, no, not that kind of drinking. She said, I'm not getting dehydrated in Arkansas. I'm just letting you know I'm drinking on this trip. She had water bottles all the way down one side of her door, stuck in the console, and she was serious. I had to stop every 45 minutes all the way to Arkansas. She said it. I had an objection, but what did I do? I didn't create disunity because that's stupid. That's like a junior move, right? No one creates disunity on a seven-hour drive with your wife. And so I objected. I handled it in the best possible way. I rolled my eyes every time we stopped. I huffed. I did all those things that we do to be passive aggressive, but Judas had an objection. He had a couple of choices. Now, how should he have handled his objection? We object. Lots of things we don't like. Lots of conversations I have I don't like. Lots of decisions I see I don't like. I object. So what? I object. So what? Well, Judas, he objected. Now, what did he do? He chose, instead of just to have a disagreement, he chose to become disagreeable. And there's a huge difference here. When you disagree with something, it has the ability to show the power of God working through the body of Christ in a family with a set of friends, with a group of people in a way that other things just don't have the opportunity to show God's power in. When a person becomes disagreeable, it divides churches, friends, church family, personal family, biological family. And there are a couple different ways that we can arrive at these different positions. If we want to handle an objection correctly, we go to the person when we have a problem. We have a personal conversation. And at the end of the personal conversation, after we get information, we choose to be a peacemaker. Now, how do you identify yourself? I was reading about this this last week. Um, What's a peacemaker? Well, it's a whole lot easier to talk about and to think about what a peacemaker is not than it is to define peacemaker. A peacemaker is not a person who gets along well with others. A peacemaker is a person that gets along well with others at all cost. A peacemaker is a person who puts others' needs before their own needs. A person who's not a peacemaker is a person who demands to have their own way, who demands that every wrong be righted, who demands that every opinion be heard. A peacemaker is a person who's willing to swallow hard, to sacrifice a little of what they may want for the greater good of the people who may be around them because there's something greater at stake. It's so important that Jesus, in John 17, when he prayed for his disciples, what did he pray for? He prayed for unity. He prayed that the world would see how strong they were together and see his strength in them, that God would protect them, that God would keep them together because the gospel of Jesus Christ through a church, through a life, through groups of friends can only be seen when people prefer the other person and their needs over their own demands and concerns, the concerns of themselves. So you go to a person You have a conversation and choose to be a peacemaker. Now, I thought about this this week. Judas could have done this. He had an objection. I don't like the fact that Mary poured her perfume out. I don't like the fact that she's wasting money. I don't like the fact that she... And he could have gone to her and pulled her aside and said, Hey, Mary, I'm just a little bit concerned about this. 
I'm not sure it's a great use of funds. I think maybe it's bad stewardship. And Mary could have said, oh, this is what I wanted to do my whole life or whatever her explanation would be. And Judas could swallow hard and go, well, it's really Mary's business. You know, Mary's the one who's given the offering. Maybe my head's not in the right spot. And he goes back and he sits down at the dinner party and everybody, what? Keeps worshiping Jesus. But he didn't do that. He chose the other option to not just disagree, but to become disagreeable. And when a person becomes disagreeable, they make their disagreement or their problem a platform, like a politician. And then they go public with it. And when they go public with it, and Judas could do this two ways, he could have gone around to each person at the dinner party and whispered in their ear, going, can you, can you believe what Mary did? Can you believe what she did? can't believe that she gave money like that to every single person. Or he could have, what he chose to do, speak up in this group and say, I can't believe what Mary did. You'll see that in just a second. But he made it a platform. He went public. He attacked her personally, and he was persistent. And because he chose to be disagreeable, Jesus rebuked him. Now, the objections that we have in our own lives, with our families, with our friends, with our churches, we can handle one of two different ways. And you see the end result of Judas choosing to handle it in a selfish, self-centered, um, self-righteous kind of way. Well, let's move on. We're just at the beginning of the story. We have a little ground to cover here. He objected, and he said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Now, money given to the poor, if you've studied Jewish society and you know the culture, the Pharisees used to say this all the time. It wasn't like they were really going to give money to the poor. When they did, they did it in the most obnoxious and most visible ways where they'd throw the money up in the air and the poor would have to go get it. It's very humiliating. It was almost sort of a saying or a slogan for ministry. Like if the pastors and I are sitting around and we're in staff meeting, let's go minister today. You know, it was a very self-righteous, smug kind of, well, let's go feed the poor today. We're going to be about the feeding of the poor business. Now, there's nothing wrong with feeding the poor. And Jesus said that. But the way that Judas was saying that he was identifying with the Pharisees, he was identifying with religion. And what he's saying is, I don't like what you just did. He makes his disagreement. He makes his objection very, very public. And he's misdirecting. He says, why did you do this instead of doing that? And so I was trying to imagine what Mary's face, what her feelings were, what her experience was. Can you imagine taking a risk as a woman going to Jesus and letting her hair down, cracking open the inheritance that she would have passed down to the next generation, pouring it on Jesus' feet and looking at Jesus with people she trusted. And all of a sudden, one person who didn't like it, didn't keep his mouth shut, but shared it with others in the room and then pretty soon, and you see this in Mark, because this story is told other places in the Gospels, the other disciples stopped worshiping Jesus and started grumbling too. And they said, wait a second, maybe she shouldn't be pouring this on Jesus' feet. Maybe there is a problem. Yes, we should be feeding the poor. And what he did was he turned a worship service into a grumbling session because he, instead of just disagreeing, became disagreeable. Now, I went immediately in my mind to Matthew chapter 7, because a critical spirit is a spirit that most often communicates the opposite of the power of Jesus Christ in a life. A critical spirit most often negates the power of the gospel shared from one person to the next. People with critical spirits toward others, toward their families, toward their friends, toward their churches, they most often show the opposite of what it is that Jesus is trying to communicate, that he's for people, that there's grace and love and forgiveness and mercy. And within the body of Christ, you find these things like you find them nowhere else. And I'll go to Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, don't be critical because if you're critical, you're going to be criticized. Now, the word here is judged. It's krino. It's translated 15 different ways, but the context lets us know that this word literally means critical. Don't criticize. Man. So I thought back over my last week. I would consider myself to not be a real critical person. But then when I started doing a little word audit, I think I can be pretty critical from time to time. I think I'm pretty quick to point out the things I don't like. I think maybe pretty quick to point out the things in other people that should be different. I think maybe sometimes I don't use my words to influence for good. Sometimes I use my words to influence for bad. My goodness, I was thinking about it from the time I woke up this morning until the time I stepped up and preached in the earlier service. The words that came out of my mouth either influenced you or whoever I talked to toward the Lord or away from the Lord. And I'm responsible for every word that I say. And you are too. A critical spirit. Man, 
we have them. And nothing is worse in Jesus' mind when it comes to sharing the gospel. And I'll try to prove that to you. So let's work through this together. Now the word a judge is the word krino. That means to criticize. And what this literally shows us is that we have a wrong view or wrong understanding of God. Whenever we criticize someone because someone doesn't do something the way we think it ought to be done, or because we believe that their motives are wrong, we pass judgment that only God is qualified to make. I lack wisdom and information. Now, I'm saying this from my perspective, but if I were sitting in your chair, I would say it from your perspective. You don't have access to all of the information. You don't know what's going on in other people's lives. I don't see their past. I don't see the battles they've been through. The things that I see in you that I might think I could judge are simply scars from battles that you fought and come through the other side stronger than I ever could be not having walked that same path that you walked. I don't know what God knows, and I have no business to criticize you. Now, sometimes we use this in church and society in a really messed up way. People say, well, don't judge. That means don't have any opinions, don't have any objective truth, don't know what you believe. That's not what Jesus was about. Jesus knew exactly who he was, what he believed, and he shared that. He loved and served and shared and showed that to the world around him. We're supposed to have strong convictions, but we're supposed to be for people. We're supposed to use words to influence and to build up. We're supposed to use our words to unite and not divide. And sometimes I would suggest to you and back at me, sometimes I should just keep my mouth shut, which is what Judas should have done. Sometimes just swallow hard. That's hard for me to do. Is it hard for you to do that too? Yeah, okay, I got at least one hand in here. I'm trying to reveal a little bit. I'm personal, then you get to be personal back to me, and then we bond. That's how it works. Does anyone ever have a problem with that? You ever go through something and say, man, I wish I could have just kept my mouth shut. But by the time we realize that we should have kept our mouth shut, it's too late. It's like taking a feather pillow, dumping all the feathers out, going, whoop, I better go get those feathers and put them back in the pillow. The ship has sailed, and then... We realize with disappointment that the only thing we can do is let the regret of not keeping my mouth shut, not using my words for good, not influencing for Jesus, to let the regret of not doing that drive me to never do it again. Man, it makes me play God, and I'm not God. To answer before listening, that's folly and shame. It's weird today not having the center screen, isn't it? Um, maybe not for you. It's weird for me because the scripture is supposed to be right there and the point's on the side. So I keep looking and, and turning it around back and forth. So um, maybe you wouldn't even have noticed if I hadn't said anything, would you? <laughs> so you have your notes if you have your church app. I don't know if I've told you that already, but there are about 10 pages of notes that we've pushed to your church app today. Uh, don't read them all while I'm talking to you because I want you to you know, look at me. But there's 10 pages of notes, um, and uh, I really encourage you to read the articles that I put in there and the extra, extra material. But the first thing I want you to notice is that it provides or presents us having a wrong view of God. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Now, this is really, really important. Because what this means is that if I believe that I'm the standard of moral excellence, that if I'm the judge of behavior, the judge of decorum, the judge of what shouldn't and shouldn't be allowed, the judge of you and your past and the mistakes that I think you've made, if I'm the one who puts myself in that place, then what that literally means is that the grace that we would get from God, that benefit of the doubt, that sort of circumstantial, I know what you've been through, he kind of removes from us and treats us more harshly. He treats us and judges us the same way that we look at and judge and treat others. But when I look at myself and the things that I do wrong, it's all omissions, oversights, good intentions, maybe an infraction here or there, but when I look at you, it's sin, right? You're an emotional terrorist. You're a, you know, I have all these things, but I view myself, I grade on the curb. Well, I'm a good guy. If you just knew the circumstances that I've been through, if you knew how rough my morning was, if you knew how bad the traffic was, I have all these excuses. And what this literally means is, is that we're without excuse, without explanation, if we don't live in community with others with grace, giving the benefit of the doubt and being for people and not against them. I look at Mary in this story just like that she was on the edge of a cliff. She had exposed her heart. She was worshiping Jesus with vulnerability, with authenticity, with integrity. She was teetering on the edge of this cliff. And what Judas did, and then the rest of the disciples, is come up and push her off and take something that should have been so beautiful and turned it into something that was devastating. And do you know what caused it? Unwise words that came out of a dark place in his heart. 
And once he said it, he couldn't get it back. The rest of the disciples who weren't thinking it, all of a sudden were thinking it. And then it became all they could see. Man, it's a wrong view of self. It's a wrong view of others. And we're going to talk about this next little passage of Scripture after I read this quote to you from Charles Spurgeon. But I hope we'll set up this next section and take us to our application. There is something in yourself that is worthy of consideration, something that you and I ought to consider. It's a big blinding beam in our own eye. As for the mote that's in your brother's eye, there's no need that you should even see it. Why beholdest thou it? Charity is ever a little blind to the faults of others, for it remembers so well its own. And that last little statement there, it's gripping. Charity is ever a little blind to the faults of others, for it remembers so well its own. My paraphrase, don't put your finger on someone else's faults unless that finger is part of a helping hand. Let's keep moving here very quickly because we have five application points, and don't let that scare you. We'll make them fast, but they're going to be powerful, I believe. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's. So let's just look at the language very quickly, and I want to just let you know that when the English translation here in the NIV that I've used says speck of sawdust, it's really a little more significant than that. Speck, the word karfos, is not a tiny piece of dust, but it's a small splinter or a twig. Now, I don't like to have my eyes um, messed with. I don't like to have them scratched. Who does, right? And I've tried to wear contacts uh, lately. And I wear them about every three days because of that reason. Something always happens to my contacts. And, and I had just the other day something going on bad wrong with my contact, and I pulled the car over, and I'm like, Joy, you've got to help me. So my contact's driving me crazy, and so I pull my eye open, and I look over at her, and she's digging in my eye, and it's in backwards, right, upside down, which I guess is not the way you put them in. And she said, oh, here's the problem. And she reached in with compassion. She reached in with love. She reached in with concern, plucked it out of my eye. I turned it around, put it back where it was supposed to go, and I saw very clearly. So it's not about never helping somebody with the thing that's in their eye. I mean, a splinter's significant. All of us have sin. All of us have pain. The two things that unite, you and me, what? Pain, sadness, or pain and disappointment, or pain and broken expectations. It unites you with me. It unites me with you. It unites you with others. All of us have thoughts. We have actions. We have attitudes that are displeasing to the Lord. But I have no business inspecting your porch unless my porch is clean. Now, this is where um, it gets hard. I can't see you that well because of the spotlights, so you'll be happy to know if I'm looking at you. I'm probably not really looking at you. But if you feel like this doesn't apply to you, that this is not a characteristic that you struggle with, it's not something that's part of your life, then chances are this applies to you more than you know. And the critical, judgmental, spirit that's developed in you has become a blind spot and if we're not careful it's going to become part of your character and not only will you ruin your witness but you'll find that your relationships with other people are fractured you end up becoming more and more alone and you're bitter and you're distant and you're sarcastic and you're jaded and the only person who cares is you. You divide yourself, you separate yourself to the point where you're living by yourself. Because a critical, judgmental, self-righteous spirit is one that God never intended. And man, it destroys the mission of the church. There was something that I read that I'm going to read to you in just a second that literally stopped me in my tracks. But before... I want to talk to you about the plank. So we have a speck in somebody else's eye. It's significant. It's a, a splinter, a twig. But what's in my eye? It's a plank, dokon, a long, thick piece of wood used for structural support in construction. Big piece of wood. 
Uh, Josephus, a church historian, says the same word was often used for the mast of a ship. When the ship would go uh, with people who were trying to conquer a land, they'd take the mast off the ship. It had a battering ram at the top of it, like a ram's horn made out of bronze. They would take this plank and they would run it into the, to the gates of the, the fort they were trying to or the castle they were trying to overthrow. They'd knock the walls down. I mean, it was a big, substantial, significant thing. And so what is this plank that we're talking about? What is the plank that you and I have in our own eyes? It can't just be ranking sin because we know that the Bible doesn't rank sin, you are either sinful and forgiven or you're sinful and not yet forgiven because we haven't asked forgiveness. This plank is self-righteousness. It's this false standard, the way we view ourselves to give us the illusion that we might sit and judge or sit and be critical, that we've achieved something in our lives morally or spiritually that makes us above other people. And I'm going to read this little section of a commentary that I read last night. My message is long done on Saturday nights. It's been, but I just have this habit on Saturday where I spend from about five o'clock on with my notes. I'm really boring on the weekends, maybe every other day too. But as a pastor, I just sort of sequester myself last night, back porch notes, reading uh, commentaries and sermons. And oftentimes we'll text things to people who I know, um, who I think will text me back and get into a conversation. Usually it's about one in five on a, on a Saturday night that are interested I was reading this, and it just literally stopped me in my tracks. So I'm going to read it to you, too. Okay? It's a comment, section out of a commentary. Um, convicted me. Um, almost broke my heart. Usually the people who see everything wrong in somebody else's life see absolutely nothing wrong in their own life. And the only gross, vile, wretched sin that never sees anything wrong in its own life, what sin is that? Self-righteousness. And that's what the plank is. As long as you're self-righteous, as long as you're spiritually proud, as long as you set yourself up as a judge, you can't help anybody out with any sin. It's interesting, though, that in the Lord's caricature, in this story, that's a far worse sin than any other. Because that's the sin, self-righteousness, where we play God. It's the vilest of all sins. Do you realize that every situation in the New Testament, Jesus condemns sin, not sinners, except this situation when someone's self-righteous? And there, he blasted the sinner with this sin because it's the worst sin of all. Not only does it play God, it denies the gospel. It denies the need for redemption. And it says, I'm holy just like I am. And so the plank is self-righteousness. And self-righteousness destroys um, I was sitting on my back porch, and when I read that, it convicted me because I see me from time to time. And I hope and trust you see you from time to time and realize that unity, that building the body up, that investing in each other and thinking the best, wanting the best, hoping for the best committing to be a permanent part of each other's lives for the glory of the gospel and the gospel alone is the reason that we weren't raptured the second we became believers. That God left us here as the church. And 1 John says that the world around us will know that God is real by the way we talk about each other, by the way we treat each other, by the way we act in the shadows when we think no one else is looking, by what we say in our small groups, by what we say in our corners, by what we say to our friends that the world's listening and they know whether or not Jesus is for real or they judge whether or not Jesus is for real by what they hear and what they see in me. Whew, man, ouch. And so I had a little prayer of confession last night and said, man, for the times that I have brought shame on Jesus Christ by the way I talk about my Christian brothers and sisters, forgive me because the gospel doesn't deserve it and it stops it in its tracks. So I want to give you some application points because the way not to be self-righteous is to be fully aware of our own sin and fully aware of the grace we need from God to forgive us of our sins. So I'm just going to give you these things very quickly. I want to encourage you to do these things. They're in your notes if you want to download them and look at them later. But the first thing is to take the time to ask God to search your heart and to point out to you things in your life that aren't right. And you know, I find that you only focus on one of two things. 
I can't focus on your issues if I'm only focusing on my own, right? If I'm worrying on my own yard, my own porch, my own sin, I'm not looking over at yours and trying to accuse you or to judge you or to cast. I mean, I'm busy trying to, to do business with God. You ask God to search your heart. In Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me, know my anxious thoughts. But who can discern their own errors? Forgiven me my hidden faults, God. The things I don't know are there. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me then I'll be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So uh, when you ask God to reveal them to you, he's going to do it. Now, it's a painful thing, but it's really good. A really, really good process. Now, this is what I want you to do. Just try it, okay? I want you to take a piece of paper, not a computer screen, not your iPad, not your iPhone. No voice to text. Take a piece of paper. If you can't find one, the church office will provide one for you and a pen. I know we don't use paper anymore in our society, but get a real pen, get a real piece of paper, and draw a line right down the middle of it. That's point B. And I want you to draw a line right down the middle of it, and on the left-hand side, I want you to write my sinful ways. Don't write my wife's sinful ways or my kids' sinful ways. Or my church's sinful ways, or my pastor's sinful ways, or my, I mean, write my sinful ways. It's easy to look at everybody else, fill out lists and lists of things for other people. This is about you and God, my sinful ways. And then on the right hand side, I want you to take scripture, and you can find it, that deals directly with the things that God reveals to you. And I want you to write out the scripture with your hand on a piece of paper and a pen because I'm telling you, it helps when you write it out. There's something about it that helps you remember, helps it a little more personal. The first thing on my list was, God, sometimes I don't use my words to build up. Sometimes I use my words to tear down. Sometimes I think I'm judgmental. So I'll just tell you the passage of scripture that I wrote down. Romans chapter 2, not in your notes. This was me and God last night after the notes were already done, already sent to you. This is just for you if you might find yourself in this situation from time to time. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 1. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment. Ouch, Jesus. The Holy Spirit was really getting in our business through the pen of the Apostle Paul. You have no excuse, those of you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself. Remember, criticizing. Because you who pass judgment, you do the exact same things. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead me, to lead you to repentance? Well, if you're really honest with God and you set aside some time, you'll probably have a list. Um, If you don't, maybe you would ask a trusted friend. I've never been bold enough, and I hope blind enough, to have to say to a trusted friend, hey, I can't find any sin in my life. Can you point something out? Um, But if you find yourself in that spot, ask your friend and let me know how that goes. Uh, God does it, and he does it because he wants to show us our sin for the purpose of C, which is to ask forgiveness for our sins. Now, when we become Christians, we confess our sin to God and he forgives us. And that's uh, uh, justification. That's, the pro- that's being saved. That's being made righteous in God's eyes. But there's a practical kind of relationship with God, a righteousness that requires a current account of sin. And when I sin in my life, it's a distance between God and me that I set. He doesn't set. And when I confess that sin, it draws us back close together again, makes things right. And not only that, but unites me to other people because it reminds me of how gracious God is when he forgives me of so much. My list of things on my sheet of paper. How can I hold something against you when I see all that God's forgiven me for? How can I be critical of you, your thoughts, your decisions, your actions, your past, if I know all that God has forgiven me for? I have to be for you. I have to be with you. I have to unite under the authority of the word of God and let it instruct us in the way we live so that we gently can take the splinters out of each other's eyes because we can't see them ourselves, but you only do that through A loving, trusting, permanent commitment with Jesus at the center. Well, that's C. D gets even harder. Seek forgiveness to those you might have hurt. It's biblical, friends. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, our translation would be if you're going to church, if you are going to worship, 
and you remember that there's a broken relationship, something that you've done, something that you have allowed to continue, what the Bible says is drop what you're doing, go make it right. And once you've done everything you can, the Bible tells us to do everything we can to be at peace. We can't always make peace. We're only responsible for ourselves. To do what you can, and then after you've done what you can, to go back and worship. The implication is that if we don't, and you wonder why you're not engaging in worship, you wonder why you don't sense the Holy Spirit in your life, you wonder why you don't think your prayers are as effective as you want, it's because we're not doing what God told us to do, and men, the one another's have to be right, or we don't get this right, and that's the way that he allowed it. I mean, the way he caused it, it's the way, I don't know, I wish it wasn't that way. But one another's are so important to Jesus that he allows our relationship and our spiritual progress to stop until we go back and make it right. All right, anyway, uh, E. The last one. Over here. Make right any wrongs that you can and pray that the Lord would help you break these sinful patterns or areas in your life. Now, go back to Judas, okay? Judas did something um, that compounded. Now, forget about the whole treachery with Jesus selling him out for money and hanging himself. That all comes later. But he did something uh, here that was unwise. He shouldn't have done, right? What did he do? Well, first of all, he was critical. Had he handled this criticism or objection directly with Mary, agreed to disagree, decided to be a peacemaker, no damage done, no problem. Everybody's still worshiping God, but because he made his personal issue public, made it a platform like a politician, begin to broadcast, begin to gather friends, begin to traffic his opinion, trying to cause dissension, then Judas, to make it right, first of all, it had to go, not just to Mary, but every single person he talked to and confessed it. And it's just like trying to put, again, a feather back in a feather pillow after you've opened that pillow up and thrown it to the wind. Every word that comes out of our mouth, we're responsible for. And when we gossip, when we traffic information that doesn't belong to us, when we criticize when we judge, when we tell stories about people that aren't our stories to tell, we're held responsible and accountable for every single word. I had one friend one time in church say, well, it's not gossip if it's true. Yes, it is. Gossip is trafficking information that doesn't belong to you, period. True or false, I hope you're not telling, telling something that's not true, but how do you know? You're not God. You weren't there. You don't have all the information. You just know what somebody told you, but yet we keep it going. Make right any wrongs that you can, and pray that the Lord would help you break these sinful patterns or areas in your life. Now, I love this. I like, in my mind, this is a passage I like to play with, not in a trivial way, uh, in an application kind of a way. Proverbs 21. A gift given in secret soothes anger. And a bribe concealed in the cloak pacifies great wealth. For those of you with really good memories, 14 months ago, I talked to you about this passage. I keep coming back to it because it has so many different nuances. Let me explain it to you, all right? There are two different parts, part A and part B to this particular proverb. A gift given in secret soothes anger. Stop. That's part one. A gift given in secret. Three kinds of gifts given back in the day, the day where this was written. One was a gift that one king would give to another. Um, you would give this gift to sort of form an alliance. It would be something that was very public, very political. The next gift would be something that you would give somebody who you thought you might want to shine up, that you might want to make friends with, that maybe was a little annoyed with you. These are the kinds of gifts that you would give in front of other people. So there were witnesses, and when they saw the gift that you gave, they would kind of hold that other person to responding in a dignified kind of a way. If I give you 20 bucks because I accidentally stepped on on your shoe, and you're like, I'm still going to punch you in the face, and your friend goes, look, he gave you 20 bucks, you'd have to not punch me in the face, because that your friend would be a witness. The third kind of gift, and this is the kind of gift that, that we're going to move to here at the end, is one that was given totally in secret, where nobody knows. Now, a, a gift given in secret soothes anger. You hand somebody a gift just between you and them, just the two of you. No one else sees it, just you and them. It soothes their anger towards you. The second part to this, a bribe concealed in the cloak. Now, the word bribe is not the same word that we use for bribe, like you give a cop 20 bucks and try to get out of a ticket. It's the same word for gift, only it's a little bit more personal, a little bit more thought out, a little more intentional. Concealed in the cloak means where nobody else sees it. People would conceal their, their swords in their cloak. They had a certain sword that they would carry, so no one knew that they were armed, and they could pull it out, and it was always a surprise. This was deep concealment, and this kind of gift is something that they would leave with somebody that they had a problem with, and they would drop it off without anybody else seeing it, even the person they were giving it to. It was concealed in the cloak and then left somewhere where the person that they were giving it to would find it, 
and nobody else would know except God. And, and the Bible says here in Proverbs that this kind of gift or bribe concealed in the cloak pacifies great wrath. Well, how would it pacify wrath if the person doesn't even know you gave it to them? The wrath it's talking about is not your wrath, or their wrath, excuse me. It's your wrath. Let me say it a different way. When you give a gift to somebody and they don't even know that they've received the gift from you, it softens your heart toward them. And God sees it. And oftentimes it can help restore or reconcile a relationship with him. The money that we give represents the condition of our heart. You want to find out what we care about? Check our bank app. There's a tie. And I've done this. If any of you have received something anonymously, it probably wasn't me, unless you really like it, then it was me. Um, try it. If you have a hard heart towards somebody, you can't seem to get over or past something. I mean, sure, if you want to just try to make things okay on the surface level, give it to them. They say thank you. They realize you gave them something. They owe you whatever. Give them something anonymously. A gift just because. A gift unto the Lord. Well, does it have to be stuff? No. I think it could be as simple as a prayer, an act of kindness, a ministry of presence. They'd know you're there. But it restores relationships. Their feelings toward you, your feelings toward them. Take the time to ask the Lord to search your heart. Make a list. Confess your sins in repentance. Seek forgiveness from those you've hurt. Make right any wrongs. And pray that the Lord would help you break these sinful patterns or areas in your life. All right, wrap this up. We're going back to John. We're going to close this out real quickly. And I'm going to just tell you this is the consequence of not doing this. I mean, Judas was rebuked by Jesus. We see it happen right here. Jesus replied, I'm sorry, in, in verse 2. It was worth a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, a keeper of the money bag. And he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, leave her alone. That's significant because this is strong language. In the English, in the NIV, leave her alone. Okay, it doesn't really, but I mean, this is like, leave her alone. It's like Jesus, mad. He is righteously mad. He is perfectly mad. He's holy when he's mad, but mad enough to, to let this emotional sort of leave her alone out because he saw what Judas' actions had done. He saw what the disciples' response was. He saw what this worship service had become. And it angered him to the point of a righteous outburst. Well, we know what happened with Judas. He left and sold Jesus out to the religious leaders of the day. But we know that the disciples and Lazarus, Simon, the leper, and the other guests learned something that day. Don't be critical. By the same measure we judge others, that's the measure God will use to judge us. Why would we be so focused with the imperfections in others without realizing and acknowledging the huge sins that exist in our own lives? If we're not, the gospel, as shared through his church, through his people, will be stopped in its tracks and we'll be guilty. Father, thank you for the time we've spent today.